All right, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, metastatic cancers and how we can infer migration histories from sequencing data. So before doing that, let me give you a quick trajectory of my own uh, timeline. So I'm from the Netherlands. That's where I did my um, undergrad uh, and also PhD. I moved to the US in 2014, and uh, I did a postdoc uh, at Brown, and then I followed my PI to Princeton when he moved. And I started my faculty position in uh, 2018 uh, at the University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign. That's where I'm currently at. And yeah, I think uh, one sentence summary of the kinds of things that I like doing. Um, yeah, biology, I think biology is like very discrete. So there's like, you know, discrete events happening. So mutations happen over time. They're rare. Uh, cancer cells can migrate. So there's a lot of discrete events. And you can try to reconstruct like the, the sequence of events that happen um, using combinatorial optimization. So just traditional computer science. That's really what I like doing. So I'm gonna give you an example of that today. Um, so there's going to be three topics. Um, we'll just see how far we get. So I, I'd, I'd like to make things in practice. So if there's questions, just interrupt me. Uh, we'll just take our time. Um, so I'll start with um, this paper that I, that I did during my postdoc. Uh, it's about inferring, you know, migration histories, and then there will be two follow-up projects. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cancer. So cancer is an evolutionary process. Um, so you can trace back, uh, when you look at a tumor, if you go back in time, you think about the very first cell that started the tumor. So that cell acquired a mutation. So this is a somatic mutation typically, so this is not a mutation to inherit. So it's not a germline mutation, it's typically a somatic mutation. And because of this somatic mutation, the cell started to divide faster than surrounding cells getting fitter. So you get something that's called a clonal expansion. So you get many more uh, descendants of that one cell with that little mutation. And these descendants, they can acquire additional somatic mutations. So this leads to additional uh, clonal expansions. And what you get in the end is this heterogeneous tumor. So this is what we call intertumor heterogeneity. I think we heard about heterogeneity yesterday. I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in biology, also in cancer biology. So there's heterogeneity within a tumor. Right, so this is important to realize. So if you compare different tumors, you know, they'll be different because these are different evolutionary processes. But if you look inside a tumor, there's actually multiple populations of different cells that have different mutations, okay? That's what we're gonna be talking about today, intertumor heterogeneity. And the other thing that could happen uh, during cancer evolution uh, is migration. So cells, so what I'm doing here is, in green, I'm indicating the primary tumor. That's where it started. Um, but what can happen is that tumor cells can leave the primary tumor and metastasize. They can start a metastasis at different locations. So this red box corresponds to a brain metastasis, and this blue box corresponds to a liver metastasis, for instance. So what's important to realize is that 90% of cancer deaths, uh, it's because of metastasis. So this is something that we want to prevent. And to prevent it, we need to understand it. So the question I'm going to be focusing on is, can we actually reconstruct you know, the pattern of metastasis? So what was the order? So which cells left the primary tumor? Um, and was there seeding from a metastasis to another metastasis, or did it all come from the primary tumor? So these are the kinds of questions that we want to answer. So let's go back a little bit and think about what I just showed you there. So when you think about, you know, cancer evolution, we're actually thinking about cell division. So when a cell divides, you get two daughter cells. Uh, and during the life cycle, the cell can acquire mutations in their past. Um, and in addition, every cell has a, uh, has a location attached to it. So we know where it resides. So what I'm showing you here is what I call um, the cell tree. So time, you know, goes from top to bottom. And the colors indicate different locations. And you can see basically in the complete trajectory of, of the whole tumor. 
and you also see migrations happening. So this is the cell tree. So this is conceptually what we want to be reasoning about. Okay. So the problem is, you know, we don't have the ability to track this process over time. So typically what happens is the only data we get is from the present time. So we sequence different locations, different anatomical locations. Um, and we just see a snapshot like this. And oftentimes, the technology that we use is bulk DNA sequencing, so it's going to be a mixture, so we have to deconvolve it. Or even if you do single cell sequencing, single cell DNA sequencing, there's lots of issues with that as well. It's very sparse, so you have to do a lot of imputation. Um, but the bottom line is, we just see like this snapshot at the end, and we want to reconstruct what happened in the past. So we can reconstruct, or try to reconstruct, the evolutionary history using phylogenetics. So there's been a lot of work in, in that field, and a lot of methods developed specifically for cancer evolution. So we're going to be hearing more about it today. Um, but my starting point is going to be this phylogenetic tree. So I'm going to assume it's been inferred. We've done a good job inferring the tree. And now we want to reason about metastasis. So in this phylogenetic tree, the leaves correspond you know, to our measurements, what we observed at the present time. So we know the location of each leaf, so that's the colored box that I have over there. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to infer the locations of the internal nodes. So the internal nodes, they correspond to ancestral clones, ancestral cells. So we don't know their location, so that's what we're trying to infer, okay? So how can we do this? So, you know, one idea is we could basically try to find a labeling of the internal nodes that minimizes the number of migrations. So well, what does this actually mean? So the, the underlying idea is that you know migration is rare, it's a rare event. So the number of migrations that happen has to be as small as possible. So this is what we call parsimony. Okay. So we want to find a parsimonious vertex label. And this notion of finding um, a vertex labeling to reason about migrations, uh, this has been observed or done for the first time, uh, as far as I know, in 1989 by Slapping in Medicine. So it was in the context of uh, uh, populations, uh, human populations. Um, but you can apply the same reasoning to cancer evolution. Okay? So what we did here is we inferred this vertex labeling that minimizes the number of migrations. So what is a migration? Migration is an edge that is incident to two vertices with different locations. So there's three migrations over there, right? So we have a migration from green to blue, green to red, and then red to blue. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. But that actually seems uh, reasonable to closely couple this with the phylogenetic uh, reconstruction. Ah, because okay. it's like yes. just another uh, Another mutation. It's another character. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a good point. That's actually uh, so, so we've done this in three layers. So the the third layer is indeed what you're saying. So can we simultaneously infer the phylogenetic tree as well as the migration history? And the idea is you could use could like you this. You infer ancestral uh, ancestral uh, uh, genotypes. Yes. It's like another exactly another, uh, dimension to the genotype. That's a very good observation. We'll, we'll come back to that. I have a slide about that. Yes. Other questions about this? Okay, so I already explained parsimony. So this is something that we do a lot in biology and evolution. Um, so if you don't know what happened, you should probably choose the sim you should prefer a simpler explanation over a more complex explanation. So this is Occam's <laughs> razor. So that's basically what we're using over here. Um, I may talk about this later, so there's additional signals uh, beyond parsimony, but let's, let's stick with parsimony for now. Um, so, so here's a problem statement. So we're giving a ruler tree, and only the leaves are labeled by locations, and we want to find an assignment of states to each internal vertex with minimum parsimony score. Right? So this is a small maximum parsimony for every problem. And it's, a, it's an easy problem. So when I say easy, it means you can solve it in polynomial time. You can do that in the program. Uh, so this is something that's covered 
mm -hmm. an introduction to black mags class typically. But there, there is something else going on here. So, but one thing that I want to mention first is like, this was done, like applying this idea of maximum parsimony, uh, was done for the first time in cancer revolution, uh, in metastatic cancer revolution, by McPherson et al. in 2016. Uh, so they looked at uh, 10 ovarian cancer patients. And here I'm showing you one such patient. So what you see over here, this patient, so this is an ovarian cancer patient. So there's seven anatomical locations. That's for, uh, it corresponds to different colors. And basically they, they ran the fish algorithm. And this is the vertex labeling they infer. And you can turn this into a migration graph. So what I did here is I'm just protect, so the vertices correspond to the location. So there's seven vertices. And I'm only retaining the migration type. So there's a migration from green to black. So that's basically what you see over here. There's three of them. Yes, please. Sorry, what, like, to do what data you have? Okay, so the data that they start with, uh, so this was uh, sequencing data uh, that they obtained from uh, ovarian cancer patients that, that had died, so it was rapid autopsy. And they just sequenced different biopsies. They did whole, uh, whole genome sequencing. So the, the, In, and also the primary tumors, they have the right and the left ovary as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's a snapshot. So it's not longitudinal, it's just the, the, the patient died and they just extracted, they took several biopsies and they sequenced them. Yeah. And there's a whole process. Uh, we're going to be learning more about it later today. Like, how do you infer this tree? It's not an easy problem. Uh, but I'm starting with this tree. Are yes. You, are you able to uh, dissect the, you know, the, the difference between? Yes, yes, you are. So there's there's a lot of information hidden here in these notes. So these edges and the notes, they're actually annotated by what are the somatic mutations that are present that distinguish different yeah. notes in the tree. Yeah, okay. so you can pinpoint what, what are the differences. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So when we saw this, we were just curious, like, is, there, is this the only solution? Are there other solutions? That's a natural question to ask, right? Because you know it's just parsimony, it's an integer, so they referred something with protein migrations. That's the best you can do. So we weren't questioning that. It's optimal by design. Uh, but are there other solutions? So it turns out there are other solutions actually. So if you look at the solution space, you can find four other solutions that also have 13 migrations. Okay. So what's going on? So here the primary is the right ovary, and here the primary is the left ovary. But they all have 13 migrations, but they look different, right? In particular, these like look very simple, less complex. So here you have like the small bowel seen in other locations. So we were just wondering, like, you know, is there something else that we can use? Is there another criteria to distinguish these solutions? You have a question, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but this is not the feature, this is not the feature I'll go to. It's not as small, it's the big. Because the trees are different. These are not the trees. So this is obtained from the trees. So the trees are all the same. It's just the vertex labeling changes. And from the vertex exactly. labeling plus the tree, you get this migration graph. Ah. Yeah, it's the same tree. The trees. Ah, yes. Same tree. Okay. Same tree. Sure, sure. Uh, or there's actually a small side note. So <laughs> I ended up implementing Sankov to do this because if you try to enumerate using Fitch, you don't get all the solutions. Yeah. So you have to do Sankov here. Right. Um, but anyhow. Um, there's different solutions and they look different. So we were wondering like, is there another criterion that we can use? So there is, so this is very important. So there's this notion of co-migration. So it turns out um, cells don't migrate like one by one. There's actually a group of cells, a cluster of cells, hundreds of cells that, you know, that co-migrate together. And this is a paper from 2016, uh, we're in a mouse model they actually had two different lineages of the tree, two different clones, and they colored them. So they had like a marker. So one clone was red, the other one uh, was, was bluish. And they saw in the bloodstream, like a co-migration happening of two different lineages. Okay, so if you think about the tree, so these are three different lineages. You know, what could have happened is that they actually correspond to one group of cells. In three different clones and they co migrate. So it's a single event. 
So there's this additional criteria, goal migration. All right? So there's a second objective, goal migrations. So when you look at this migration graph, so it's a multi-graph, right? So there's multi-edges. So you can think about goal migrations as the number of multi-edges in the migration graph. So this will be one goal migration. So here, the goal migration number is 10. So if we go back to these solutions that we had here, to these five different solutions, so what was reported in the paper at 10 goal migrations, but these two solutions there on the right, they have seven co migrations, right? So it's more parsimonious. So that's kind of like the idea behind this paper. So there's a second objective, co migrations, that we also want to optimize for. Now, this is a complicated slide, so let's let's start looking at this here. So we have co migrations and we have migrations. Okay. So M is the number of anatomical locations that we have. So the number of metastases is M minus one, right? Because there's one primary location, so we have M minus one metastases. And each of these metastases, they need to be seeded, right? So this basically means that the low bound that we have on migrations is M minus one. So we need at least M minus one migrations to seed M minus one metastases, right? Okay, and co-migrations is, is just grouping the migrations together. So there's also like a similar lower bound here for co migrations. And it turns out, like if you have M minus one migrations and M minus one co migrations, you're actually in this regime. Uh, so this is what we call monoclonal seeding. And it's also single source seeding. So each metastasis is seeded by one clone. Right? So that's the simple scenario. And you can make it more complicated. So this is a tree, you can make this a DAC, so you can have a location that is seeded from two different locations, right? And there can also be reseeding. So reseeding basically means they're seeding back and forth. There's a cycle in the graph, in the migration graph. So that's like one dimension, the, 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 the topology of the graph. And the other dimension that we have is whether there was polyclonal seeding, whether there were multiple clones co migrating. Okay, good. So the problem that I just sketched here is summarized over here. So we're given a phylogenetic tree and the tree, we know the locations of the leaves, but we wanna find a vertex level, we wanna label the internal nodes such that we minimize the number of migrations and then subsequently we minimize the co-migrations. So that's what we're trying to do. Do you guys have any ideas on how you can approach this? Like, so we pose the problem, what's next? Like, how do you, like, what do you do with that? Do you have a problem? I have a question. Yes. So, how, you know, the co-migrations, right, they're, yes. they somehow combine information across different parts of the tree, right? Yes. So how do they look like in the tree? Like, you, you have to have side information, right, somehow. They look like, um, so they basically correspond to distinct lineages that are grouped together. Yeah, so, but, but yeah. what I'm saying is that how do you know that those three could be co-migrated? Does that make sense? By the coloring, right? By the other graph, by the other graph, the migration graph. Yeah, so it's the coloring, so basically the source, the target, uh, no, they must have the same location, so it's green, Oh, I see, green, I see, red, I see, red. I see, yeah. so, I see. Yeah. so that's, so I see, so anytime you change, have an edge with different colors, yeah. you can use that more than one time. Yes, Okay. Yeah. Let's actually jump ahead, so you're, okay. I, I want to speed things up. I'm going to yeah. go back to this, so this is related to the questions you ask, and we do this simultaneously with tree inference. But I want to talk a little bit about what is a co-migration. <laughs> and I think you recognize yeah. this guy over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a collaboration that started at CGSI last year with CB. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about it. So I want to talk about, you know, what are co-migrations, and one of the co is temporally consistent. So here's a little bit more precise definition. So co migrations are migrations between the same pair of locations that happen simultaneously. Okay? So if there is no reseeding, the number of co migrations equals the number of multi edges that you have in the in the migration graph. Let's let's look at reseeding. So this is 
So we have three CD, okay? So you guys see what? So blue goes to red, red goes back to blue, and then blue goes again to red. So if I count the number of multi-edges, there's only two multi-edges here, right? Blue goes to red, and red goes to blue. So that would imply two co-migrations. But that's not gonna work, because this will be blue to red, and there's blue to red here again. So if we, basically, if we claim that they happen simultaneously, that's not gonna work, because to get W, this migration must have happened, red right, to blue. So that, that's not working. So what we did in the Machina paper, we added this constraint that co-migrations, so there's an additional condition here, they had to be on distinct branches of the tree, distinct lineages of the tree. So I cannot group this migration together with this one because it's on the same root to leaf path. Right? So that's, that's basically what we did in the paper. You can, the way you can compute this number, like what is the minimum number of co migrations subject to this constraint, you look at, you fixed, uh, you fixed basically uh, two locations, source and target location, and then you look at all root to leaf paths, and you count the number of migrations uh, uh, of those two colors on the root to leaf path. And the maximum number across all root to leaf paths, that's the number of co migrations between those two locations. And then you sum them up. That's precisely what this equation here is saying. But the bigger point is you should, yeah, I think this idea of they have to be in distinct branches, that's basically what I'm trying to convey here. Yes? Sorry, is it, how do you understand the causality of what? How do you understand the causality of what? Yeah, like which way is the causality of what? Oh, like here in the tree? Yeah, yeah. Just in general. In the, how does the algorithm work? Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so this, this all goes back, so there's another big difference between like cancer evolution and species evolution. So the root node is a normal cell. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the germline cell, so our trees are rooted. So our phylogenies are rooted. So there's like direction in the tree there. And you get your directionality just from the tree itself. So when you do the coloring of the nodes, the tree gives you the directionality. Well, she's talking about the, the migration. How do you know which direction the migration is going? Yeah. Especially when it goes back and forth. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is these edges, they're all directed away from the root. Yeah, because if, if yeah. there's several ones going the migration, if, there, if there's like so many areas that are showing up, like how do you map it? Oh, you have to map it back to the tree. So I, I, won't, I won't be able to for like ordering just looking at this migration graph. I have to look back at a tree, and the tree has directionality in it because it's rooted. Yeah. So like every solution that you have will then give you the full migration history. Yes. And so different solutions will have different migration histories and potentially different things could have gone in different directions. Exactly, yes, okay. yes. That's that's another key point. So this is not, I'm not saying this is the unique solution. There's actually multiple solutions. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yeah. We're gonna be talking about it. It's like the third topic. Okay, but this this is basically what we did, all right? But so this is a this is not good. This is like a, a hack, and I'm gonna show you why. Uh, so that's kind of like what we did with Sigi. Uh, so let's take a look at this. So here's a very simple example. So using this principle, I would say cyan to orange, they're on distinct branches. They can be a coma right? Red to green. They're on staying branches, they can be a common branch. But this doesn't work because for this co-migration to happen first, followed by this, this lineage must have been present. Right? So there's like a there's just something broken here. But this satisfies that constraint that I just talked about. So that was kind of like the whole premise of this, of the work that we did with Sabine. So what you have to do is you have to break either this co-migration or that co-migration. So if you break this one into two pieces, like we could have you know, this happen first. So when this happens, we can actually do this call migration. So that's what I'm showing over here. And then finally, the third one. So we're underestimating the number of call migrations using this 
constraint. So that's why it's a hack. It's not correct. It's not valid if it's feasible. So this is temporally inconsistent, right? Any any questions about this? So this is kind of like a key slide here. Right. So there's a couple of questions that arise in here. So now we kind of like have this example. So this is kind of like the so, so just thinking about like how projects proceed. Th this example is. I should have put a picture of the, the whiteboard. It was literally this example. That's what started this project. Okay. But it's going to lead to a lot of different questions. So the first question is, you know, so this is not good. So how do we arrive at this? Or can we actually decide whether, you know, a set of comma directions are temporally consistent? So given a rooted tree and a set of comma directions, you know, are there timestamps such that time moves forward. So here we would like label it one, two, three. Um, so that's the first question that we asked. So this this is actually a, a relatively simple problem, but it took us a while to, to see the solution. <laughs> um, so what you can do is uh, you can construct what we call a call migration graph. And the idea is, um, so we're given the call migrations. And basically, each commagation is going to be a node in this commagation graph. And there will be an edge if the commagations are kind of like consecutive on the tree. So we have an edge from green to orange, right? and from orange to gray. And we have this beautiful theorem that, you know, commagations are temporally consistent if and only if the commagation graph is a DAG, it's a directed acyclic graph. Because if it's a directed acyclic graph, you can just do a topological ordering, and then you get your timestamps. That's precisely what's going on here. So that's so this is easily solvable. You can do this in a linear time. Um, so the next question that you can ask is, you know, what if we're not given the set of call migrations? So the only thing that we're given is the rooted tree, uh, but we're given actually the vertex labeling. So we're given the locations of the leaves, but also the ancestral nodes. Can we find a set of co-migrations that are parsimonious? So we want to minimize the number of co-migrations, right? So I, I won't have time to go into this, but this, this problem is empty hard. Right? So, what a, so basically the, the thing that I showed you first, like just split co migrations if they're understanding branches, that doesn't work. It's not gonna it's it's not a solution. It was kind of like a counterexample. So to actually solve this properly, it's 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 NPR. So that, that was kind of like what was going on in this paper. Um Mohammed, yes. short question. Yes. Yeah it is NPR, but you knew it already in the machina time. No, what we were doing in machina was not correct. We were doing this this hack. Yes, correct. Yes, yes, yes. We were solving a slide like it's, it's not even a, yeah. a constant factor approximation. It's, 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 it's interesting, we can talk about that. Um, but that problem is hard, okay? So, okay, so I basically, so there's something interesting going on. Uh, so when we went back to real data, we were curious if this phenomenon of like temporal inconsistency actually arises in real data, if we would use the machina solution, the machina heuristic. And it turns out it doesn't. So on real data, like we don't see violations of temporal consistency with like the machina heuristic. But it's still valuable to actually reason about, um, you know, consistency, temporal consistency of your biological model. I think that's kind of like the, the take home lesson here. Uh, even though it didn't, you know, it, it was broken in theory and in practice, the Migration histories that we see aren't that complex where we would have them all in consistency using the heuristic. Uh, but now we actually better understand the model and we better understand you know, the heuristic that we actually uh, implemented in Martina. All right? Good. So let's, let's move on to the third topic. Um, You've got one more. I got one minute? Okay. <laughs> Just a take on message there. Yeah. Uh, so there's multiple solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's important to actually, instead of thinking only about one solution, you should think about the solution space. So in general, like 
you know, biologists like to think of like organs as black boxes or something they just put in methods in their paper and they just ran a method, they got a solution. But I think we as method developers, we have to be very careful. We have to think about, you know, are there alternative solutions? How do they change conclusions? Uh, so that's, that's kind of like what we're doing over here. So we're trying to reason about the solution space. Can we enumerate solutions? If it's too large, can we sample solutions in the problem pattern? Can we summarize them? And how do they change conclusions? That's kind of like the, the story there. But you can just ask me about it. So there's a lot of fun work that we did there. And it's together with, uh, actually, let me just jump to my own slide. Yeah, so this, this third topic is together with uh, Simone and Nikki from uh, UCL Cancer Institute UK. So I want to acknowledge uh, my group, uh, in particular, Mrimoy, who did uh, the bulk of the work that I showed today. Um, and yeah, my funding agencies. And Sagi, of course. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone.